Will you raise your hand? Fantastic. Um, so, uh, 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 welcome. What we're going to ask you to do when we finish is to raise your hands again. And so, um, so we're going to ask uh, someone from LMDA to go introduce yourself to someone from Directors Lab North, because it's a missed opportunity if we don't connect our two groups while you're here today um, for this um, fantastic and much anticipated conversation. So I would like to bring our conference chair, Joanna Falk, up to the stage. Um, I'm Joanna Falk. I'm the literary manager at the Tarragon Theatre, and I am the conference chair for the LMDA conference. Hi, welcome. <laughs> um, one of the pleasures, one of the many pleasures of being a conference chair is that you get to um, curate conversations, invite folks that you always wanted to talk to. Um, I said to someone yesterday, I feel like I've curated this entire conference mostly for myself. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm glad you're all here enjoying it with me, hopefully. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to um, have Anne Catanio and Sarah Garten Stanley here. And we're going to just have a big old conversation about directing, dramaturgy, leadership. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions near the end. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. <laughs> um, we've got about an hour. Do we like how we're seated? Do we like how we're seated? <laughs> <laughs> Directors. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to read their whole bios. I'm just going to read the first few lines of both of their bios, and you can Google the rest. Anne Catanio is the dramaturg of the Lincoln Center Theater and the creator and head of the Lincoln Center Theater Directors Lab, a three-term past president of Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Americans, Americas, she is the recipient of LMDA's first Lessing Award for Lifetime Achievement in Dramaturgy. Uh, originally from Montreal, Sarah is the Art Associate Artistic Director of English Theatre at Canada's National Arts Centre. She is the creative catalyst for the Spiderweb Show and the former AD of Buddies and Bad Times Theatre. Um, Sarah was recently awarded the Elliot Hayes for, her, for Dramaturgy for her work on The Cycle, focusing on the Indigenous body of performance work in Canada. Wow. <laughs> so as I said to both of you, I, this is really meant to be a conversation. I'm just going to loft some softball questions at both of you, and I'm happy for you to just take them and run. Um, the first one, I, I just, I'm always curious about people's origin stories, how they came to theater. Um, so what made you decide you wanted to make theater your profession? Or how uh, or when did you know that you wanted to make theater your job? <laughs> I thought that was an easy one. <laughs> I just have to say that I'm such a fan. Um, <laughs> if I'm looking nervous and weird, it's partly just uh, it's the first time we've actually met. So, um, and I tend to avoid people that I'm in awe of. So. <laughs> Um, I can start. Yeah, I, uh, I always wanted to do it, like from as far back as I could remember. Um, probably from the first time I was told uh, when I was, you know, five uh, that I was terrible, uh, that uh, from a perspective of uh, like gender, that I didn't fit into the roles that were uh, intended for little girls doing little things. and. Um, and uh, I think I think anger. It was a way. For, I was a very angry kid, and I think that uh, theater and the expression of uh, created states uh, afforded me an opportunity to uh, come into the world. Um, so I think I knew from a very early stage. That and a super cute story. When I was five, I called around to a lot of ad agencies uh, in the Yellow Pages and asked if they could hire me uh, to be in the commercials, but that didn't. Happen. So acting was kind of the first thing you thought, I'd like to be yeah, an actor? Yeah, to like totally. I had no, yeah, no sense of the others. And then when did, you, when did you think, well, maybe not acting, maybe something else? <laughs> After you were fired from your first acting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, consist it's, it's sort of a consistent thing. I mean, I, I, do, I do perform, but I don't act mm -hmm. now. And so I think... I'm not very. I'm just not good. I'm just not good at it. So, uh, but uh, but I think uh, also uh, the theater again allowed me an opportunity to 
uh, create spaces where I could control chaos. And, mm. uh, and I think that's uh, something as an actor you can't do. Mm -hmm. You know, an actor you have to, I think, really embrace the, your, your, parti your, your, your part participation in that chaos. So uh, mm. yeah, I'd say from a very early age. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, I, I've, I've never been asked this question, um, and I would, I would, uh, the reason that I have never been asked it or have wanted to answer it is that I really, but I will, I, I don't think it's a very um, useful question for dramaturg, and I would refer all of you guys to um, a person I learned about only in the last couple of years, a, a dramaturg named Kurt, K-U-R-T, Hirschfeld, H-I-R-S-C-H-F-E-L-D, who was a dramaturg of the Zurich Schauspielhaus. He came from Berlin, he was Jewish, got out in 33, went to Zurich, couldn't get a job running a theater because, you know, he was Jewish, whatever. So he worked in an operetta house that was the Zurich Schauspielhaus for this guy who was, you know, the artistic director who had a board or wherever he had and could socialize. And proceeded to rescue every Jewish actor who had to get out of Germany and for the next 30 years perform world premieres of, you know, Mother of Courage, Life of Galileo, mm -hmm. introduced the entire German repertory, I mean, excuse me, the current German repertory, introduced Miller, Albi, Elliot, Lorca, I mean, what this guy put on in Zurich um, sort of behind the back of his artistic director mm -hmm. <laughs> with this incredible acting company starting in 33. Um, when he found some local writers who turned out to be not too bad, who he encouraged to write for the stage, um, Friedrich Dürrenmatt, Max Frisch, <laughs> you know, and, and at his uh, birthday celebration when he turned 65, he's passed away now a long time ago, they said um, there's something about the anonymity of a dramaturg mm -hmm. that he would he must be feeling awkward now to, to be asked personal questions because his, yeah. it's not that he's not a colorful person, but he, all of his energy has been poured into his work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I felt bad that I didn't know about him. I'm mm -hmm. writing a book right now, and I, so I'm doing a big thing on him because <laughs> boy did he change the course of human right. events. Right. So just to do my quick story, um, I, I grew up in California. I did not want to go to college, so I went and lived in Europe for a year, which is the reason I speak some languages. I went back, I went to a women's college. I was a, I was a physics major. Mm -hmm. And when you ha are a physics major, you have to take physics one, organic, and calculus five days a week at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. And like in the June of the end of my freshman year, after some long weekend in Berkeley, I came yeah. back with 100 calculus problems to do. And they thought, you know what? This is just not going to be the way it's going to go. <laughs> so I had been interested in, um, you know, I've been interested in music and, and theater, and, and it was a, a time, this is obviously, you know, Berkeley in the late 60s, living theater, and, you know, th there was a whole bunch of really interesting stuff. And I had no real interest in the, the production and the performing of it, I certainly didn't want to act, but I really liked it and I liked the literature. Mm. And so after a couple of years, which, which are not too important, I realized that was kind of it. Mm. But it was not at all from a production point of view, it was from a literary point of view. Mm. And then I started getting work in theaters as ass assisting people, mm. and that eventually led to uh, studying. I didn't know what to do because I n knew I couldn't and didn't want to act. Mm. Uh, so I so I was actually trained um, as a drama critic. I mean, I worked as a drama cr critic. I worked as a drama critic in San Francisco for all of the underground papers, you know, the Berkeley Bar and mm -hmm. San Francisco Good Times. I would have to like wear jeans <coughs> and, and drive over and deliver my copy to a commune, and they would say things like, "Whoa, this guy like Moliere, like who who was he?" And I would say. <laughs> <laughs> He was a real revolutionary, you know, the king, and he and the king had this thing, and he got banned, and said, okay, we can print, we can print that one. <laughs> and then I was lucky enough to get a job for Ed Hastings, who was the second in command at ACT. The difference between the commune and ACT, where no one had ever smoked dope, they only drank Manhattans in a bar. I never heard of a Manhattan. I don't think I ever had a drink in my life. Was was the 
was the beginning of my entrance to the theater and the end of the story. So I still embrace the commune and I still embrace <laughs> ACT and they, because they were the beginning of my first year in the theater. Wow. Uh, was directing ever a thing you thought about doing? I, I did direct plays. Mm. Uh, uh, I've directed maybe four or five plays, mm -hmm. and I found myself, and I love actors, they're all my best friends, right? But I found myself at 12.30 at night, and all of you who have directed plays have been in the same job, taking a phone call and saying, but you are wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you do that with playwrights? Uh, well, usually not at 12.30. Uh, <laughs> Different. Yeah, and I just thought, you know what? I just don't want to do this for a living, so, so I'll let somebody else do it. And, and actually, the great <laughs> dramaturgs of Germany, who I knew, the, the Schauwitter people, they considered themselves. I mean, they would not want me to say this, but above the directors, like let them deal <laughs> with the twelve thirty phone calls. You just come up with the ideas. <laughs> and does your does your physics background know? <laughs> I give it a shot. <laughs> no, but you know, it's, it's, it is weird. It is weird now. I mean, it's. I, I just find so many things weird now. I mean, it's not that hard passing calculus one. Anybody here in this room pass calculus one? Okay. I mean, come on. I mean, it, although sometimes I'm glad to hear that because sometimes it gets a reputation like, oh my God, what is this? You know, and we're, we're, I'm about to do Tom Stoppard's The Hard Problem, which is a somewhat you know science-based thing, and. You know, it's it's not that hard. The hard. I mean, solving the hard problem, of course, is impossible. But what it is, but but there's really become a divide, and I'm glad that it's not in this room. That there there are those of us who can read, and there are other ones who can add, and <laughs> readers can't add, and the adders don't read, which I I think is really false. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always try to encourage young people, like, you know, take a math class. I mean, mm. meet different kind of people and, you know, you'll, you'll learn something. Mm. I mean, I do, I did keep my calculus one book and it might as well be written in, you know, I don't know what language. It's completely incomprehensible to me <laughs> <laughs> at the time. <laughs> um, so one of my favorite sessions at LMB conferences is the Hot Topics, um, which we had yesterday and there were some pretty hot topics, I think. Um, so I wanted to ask you both, what, what is your hot topic right now in terms of theater? What are, what are your burning questions? What are you thinking about? Uh, race, class, and story. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you all to just speak just a little bit? Sorry, uh, yes. yes. And we don't want to miss any words. Uh, yes. Uh, my answer was race, class, and story, and where we center the story at this moment in time with the the intersection, particularly those two questions. There's there's other other parts uh, mm -hmm. that are that come into that intersection, but uh, that for me is what I'm I'm most uh, I spend most of my time thinking about. Uh -huh. <coughs> uh, I I am in the nightmarish process of finishing a book about how to be a dramaturg. It's horrible. I mean, it's, 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 it's like 80,000 words. It's coming out. I have to turn it in in September. So I have been thinking about this question. Um, and to me, the, the, which I didn't know until I had to write all this down, to me, I think the, the really important, most important thing that I hope I can leave as a legacy is really a, one that is a s social model, which is the way that theater people collaborate. Um, theater is a, uh, is, a, is a world that deals with emotion. And it deals with very, usually, <laughs> If you look at the Greeks or Shakespeare or what's you know, a lot of writers say, very dark emotion, very dangerous emotion. Very, it's not like a sanitized place, okay? And and over two thousand years, there's been a relatively unchanged way of people coming together um, to figure out a way of of working with that emotion in a way that is free and uncensored. That's definitely guided guided by the group until about 200 years ago when directors were invented and then directors sort of guided it. And then that, that emotion 
what it is distilled into starts to work with an audience and all you know the theory of motor neurons and and people's hearts beating together while they're in a room together um, but I think fundamentally what I hope to to note in this book um, is that this is relatively unique that that people from many different backgrounds, many different ways of life. Um, I actually note in the book, because this occurred to me one day, if you turned on the work lights in the Bowman on a big show and you asked everybody in that room to stand across the proscenium, you would have a complete cross-section of the, of the, uh, of society. You would have actors, you would have dressers, you would have ushers, you would have directors, you would have box office people, you would have, you know, you would have, uh, wardrobe, I've spent years working sewing in wardrobe, you know, it's, it's, not, it, it's not one social class that's represented, it's not one, it, it really is like a microcosm of, of, your, of your city. That's what, it, that's what it's always been. Um, and, and everyone is working harmoniously together. And when, when if that can be then uh, opened up to include an audience, so it's not just playing to itself. It's not just playing to others. It's playing to everyone. That's when I think it has its power. And I think that freedom of, of, uh, and compassion that allows you to listen to somebody else, that allows you to change how you are, uh, what your ideas are, how you're feeling about things, so that you can work together, is something that, that we, as theater people, have that's quite unique. Mm -hmm. I wish we could make everyone in Congress put on a play, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and they might learn something from us, yeah. but they're not interested in us, you know? But, but somehow that I see as a, as a model that um, it's worked forever. That's why it's, we're still going on, even though the theaters died every 10 years. I don't, us. Know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if I entirely agree. I, I, I don't entirely agree. I, I feel that we're at a, a particular moment where this idea of what theater is, uh, is 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 based on a set of agreements. I wouldn't even say conventions. It's agreements that we show up to it with a certain set of presumptions, assumptions, and language, and that. Once that collaborative space uh, is launched, it's based on a, an idea that may not be held or, uh, or valuable to some of the people who are standing across that <coughs> stage. And, and for me, that's why race, class, and story, like what are the stories that we're, we show up to, a, how do we make those agreements? I think is the first part of my question um, when I think about that image because it's still somebody out looking at it from one perspective, and we're in a breakdown of perspectives right now, which I think is both exciting, mm -hmm. uh, but for the theater, it's, it's, it's deeply challenging. I'd agree that we're the, we're the place to do that. We're the place to engage in that conversation. Um, but even by saying the we, I, I, I'm speaking already from a, from a very particular perspective. And um, so, I, I, I love that as an ideal, but I do feel that we're in a, and I'm sure you've written about it in your book, but I feel like we're at a place where we're just undoing a lot of those basic ideas um, mm -hmm. about how theater uh, can operate and what collaboration actually means. Well, I mean, I agree with you because um, a book that I have found very influential lately, um, and you probably know it, is Todd London's book. An ideal theater. Mm -hmm. He had the really brilliant idea of just taking the mission statements of, I don't know, something like 55 theaters or 65 theaters um, in the United States from the last, you know, 200 years. Right? Where's Mark Bly, who always knows more than I do? 200 years, <laughs> something like that. I mean, and some of them you know, there are regional theaters that still exist, but some of them you don't know. Some of them don't exist anymore. The Free Carolina Players. Or, yeah. Caramu or the Guthrie or whatever, but I mean, if you if you what you're what you're describing is is sort of inevitably the march of history. I mean, those those the group theater, you know, got somebody to donate a farmhouse up somewhere I don't remember, near Kingston or something, and they didn't even know who the playwright was and who the director was and who the actor was, and they had to talk, you know, Clifford Odets into writing and and talk Ilya Kazan into directing and stuff. So it, it isn't like you go in with a model, and you, you have to figure out, is it a collective, is it a, what's the hierarchy, and then most importantly, what are we playing? You know, who are we speaking to? What's the connection gonna be when, when we 
when we finally open to an audience. And I think what, what's, what you're saying is, is exactly what I'm saying, it's just the next, that's what, it keeps evolving. We're certainly not making theater the way it was made in the past, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. but, but if we are open to each other, a structure will emerge as well as a production. Mm -hmm. I think. A structure of creation mm -hmm. will emerge. Yeah, can I keep going on this? I, I, mean, I, I, think, I think it's, because I, I have been thinking a lot about this with yeah. respect to opening, yeah. like what it means to be open to one another and mm -hmm. how, how many people that I uh, have in, in the last number of years had the opportunity to collaborate with mm -hmm. where uh, the expectation of the time frame for that opening has shifted enormously because what I've come to realize is that to truly collaborate um, across difference means changing all of my all of my considerations about um, the space that I hold in the conversation mm -hmm. and that a lot of the work is earning a space to engage in the conversation and, and flipping the paradigm of position in that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a real challenge to the way we make, make theater now. Mm -hmm. It's a real challenge to the idea of theater being something that can uh, employ us because it, it, it's a community engaged model ultimately that, that makes it really difficult for people to feel confident in a mass way to show up to buy a ticket to see a piece. And so I feel like in this, in this moment where theater is so exciting to me is that it's really working through that, this troubled time mm -hmm. and coming up with new collaborative ways to engage. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I, it seems like yesterday, but 25 years ago I started this director's lab and now there's like director's lab, I just got a WhatsApp from my newest, which is a Mediterranean lab of people from countries <laughs> bordering the Mediterranean. They're meeting to write their applications starting next year. I mean, um, I'm, I'm very interested in the last five years in people who are working in communities. Mm -hmm. Because um, that, that seems to me to be a really interesting challenge. You know, who are you playing for, and how are you engaging them, and what what kind of spaces are you working in? So, so I, I I take a lot of people in the lab now who are not. I mean, I take New Yorkers. Obviously, I'm a New York lab, but but I've taken lots of people who are starting theaters in Walla Walla or Las Cruces <laughs> or, or places, and so very successfully because because it isn't like you have a huge equity base in, <laughs> in Walla. You know, you've got to figure out. Who are your actors? I mean, it's the same question that you had to figure out in London in, you know, 1593. Mm -hmm. So that's going to move that forward. And there is so much happening in this country along those lines. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it, be it becomes interesting to me to really, you know, I'm not pushing by any means a New York model, especially mm -hmm. now. I mean, Broadway has just turned, turned into a, you know, a, a very successful sort of tourist hub. Mm -hmm. Most of the, the new plays are not able to be funded on Broadway. Mm -hmm. So so I think it's inevitable that that's where it's going, and I think it's good for the country. Mm -hmm. And in a way, when I started in the theater in the 70s, it was regional in nature. Mm -hmm. You know, they were, the, they were the, you know, the kind of Western writers, like Sam Shepard, you know, and there were the Southern writers, like Sam Art Williams and Beth Henley, and there were the Philadelphia gang. Bill Gunn and Albert and Arano and Charles Fuller and there were the Chicago people and you, you really had a sense of different Steve Tessa in Chicago, you know, different regional <coughs> feels to things. And I think that's a much healthier situation than when when everyone just looks at, you know, the top five plays that have won the same prizes and produces them. It's better if it's much more disparate. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of where we are now. Mm -hmm. which we... I wanted to follow up then uh, talking about collaboration, because you both also teach. Um, so what do you teach your students, be they playwrights or directors or dramaturgs, about collaboration? Well, I don't really teach. I teach, I teach at Juilliard. I just teach first-year actors theater history. Ah. And, and I, so it's a very weird, I mean, it's, it's a very specific thing, you know. <laughs> what do you have to know if you're an actor about um, particular plays, you know, like if you're playing a part in Shakespeare and you're the second son, you got to know what that means. You know, is that kind of information? Mm -hmm. so it's not mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. it's not really useful mm -hmm. in terms of this discussion. Great, <laughs> great. Right. 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 What about the director's lab? Well, the director's lab is definitely not a teaching lab. I have, mm -hmm. I, I gather everybody mm -hmm. and then I leave. 
<laughs> okay, if you have to teach it. Okay, but, but, but I totally, yeah. I totally want to pick up on that because I don't teach uh, anymore either, and I don't, and I right. don't, I don't, I really just don't feel like having to teach, and, I, and it's taken me a long, a long time to just come to the, the point where I've just felt like it's, I was just writing on like, please like what I have to say, and just, I just feel mm -hmm. like uh, what I can offer is my fandom. Like mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a fan, and mm -hmm. uh, that that love that I can offer artists and uh, appreciation and acknowledgement mm -hmm. and being present for that is amazing. And I agree. Like I just try as best as I can. And collab the collaborations that I um, curate at the at the NEC is entirely based on that. It's mm -hmm. just like I just yes, go do. I lo I love. I'm gonna love it. I'm gonna love it. Mm -hmm. No matter what, I'm gonna love it. If you're doing it and you love it and you can profit off of me loving it and mm -hmm. us loving it. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's that's mm -hmm. the, the the most powerful thing I feel like I can do. Yeah, I mean, I, and I would just add to that. I mean, I think I think the the downside of being a dramaturg. I know I'm talking to directors and dramaturgs, but the downside of being a dramaturg is that uh, there's just too many opinions in the world nowadays. <laughs> we don't need more opinions. We, you know, if you have a relationship with somebody, over time they're going to talk to you. You're going to have conversations with them, etc. But but what 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 we can do is just say yes, we can support, we can say you can do this. Um, and, and so many writers I, I, I you know, talk to, I mean, just this week I've gotten things. It's like, it's so difficult to write a play that just saying, keep going, you can do it. I mean, I hear this over and over again. That's what's needed. So, so in some ways in production, I don't really have an opinion about things. I, I try and kind of suss out what people need or what people want or what they don't know or what would be useful and can I help you get it or can I help you write it, but I'm not going to say wrong, right, you know. I mean, in a way, in production, that's the director's job and a good director will allow, again, as I said from the very beginning, people to feel free to really be, to try things, as you know, in your own theater, and, and dealing with the material that we're dealing with, you, 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 you need to feel free, because the material is not, you know, <coughs> light and joyful in the theater. It can be very dark. So figuring out how to, to deal with it individually as artists, as actors, designers, and then how to channel that into the vision of the creator, whether that's a collective creation or whether that's an individual creation. That, that's when you can begin to say, hmm, that seems good or that, but, but, but not, to, not to have such quick opinions about things. And I think playwrights resent, I actually, in, in the end of a, cha a particular chapter, I asked all these writers, what is the most helpful thing a dramaturg has ever said to you, and what is the least helpful thing? <coughs> and it always boils down to opinions. You know, mm -hmm. you can't write a comic scene after a trial. You know, mm -hmm. it's like who, who said this? You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just the, just saying yes mm. will get you further, mm -hmm. even if you think you sound like an idiot, than than having too many opinions. Mm -hmm. Which, not that you shouldn't have them, but you need to have them in at the right time, at the right moment, with the right person. Mm -hmm. um, the word uh, gatekeeper or gatekeeping has come up a lot in the last couple of days in terms of um, folks who work in institutions. And uh, I'm sort of less interested in what you're keeping out, but what you're trying to bring in. What are the what voices or what are, what do you feel like you're wanting to bring into your institutions? <laughs> well, I mean, the gatekeeping thing is um, uh, is, is very uh, critical. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gotten much more critical and much worse over the years. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean, sorry? What do you mean that it's gotten? Well, uh, uh, I actually, I was frightened to print my book out because I haven't read the whole thing together because I thought it would be so terrible. But when I, went, I did print it and I brought it to Toronto and I went back to read my first chapter, which I finished in August, and it was kind of, kind of interesting things in it. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was talking about how the, how the whole profession began. And in the United States, um, you know, the first regional theaters were built in the late 60s by Ford Foundation money. Uh, not the Guthrie, but you know, the, the, um, you know, the arena, 
Houston, Lincoln Center, the alley, et cetera. Uh, late 60s, they have, the buildings were finally done, and then the question was going to be who was going to work in them? You know, what was, the, what was it going to be? So the thought was that they would be like, re, you know, European theaters. They would do classic reps with, you know, acting companies, but then the acting companies never materialized because the actors had too much work in Hollywood. And this corresponded with this incredibly um, powerful, almost Elizabethan, I would say, wave of playwrights. Mm -hmm. If you look back, whether, you know, the range from, you know, from, from Lanford Wilson to Antizaki Shange to, to Tina Howe to, to, you know, all those other people I've mentioned, I mean, it was in David Mamm and Shepard, it was incredible the, the quality of writing. And none of these people had ever gone to college. I don't know why they all started writing plays because there was, <laughs> There was no, you know, training at that point. And they all came into these new theaters as unsolicited manuscripts. So someone had to read them. Uh, so that's how many of us got our jobs, because we're like, who's reading these? And there were no agents. That Audrey Wood was the only agent in America, and Helen Merrill, the two, they were the only two. And so we all, whether we were all friends, Morgan Janess was at the public, um, Rod Marriott was at Circle Rep, Steve Carter was at the NEC, I was at the Phoenix, Andre was at Playwrights Horizons. We would read like, you know, 50 plays a week. Mm -hmm. And they would be, you know, amazingly interesting playwrights who now you've heard of, and you know, the usual unsolicited things. Mm -hmm. So there was no winnowing down from that. And that was like the best thing, because uh, as, I, as, I, as I always say, Imagine being the first reader of Waiting for Godot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Luckily, it was Roger Blanc, thank God. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't look like a play. It doesn't look like anything that's come before it. So if you read that play for the first time, especially if, which I just hate, especially if you only read 10 pages of that play, mm -hmm. which some people at theaters do, you're, you're just going to reject it. It's, gonna, mm -hmm. it's just going to be so out of bounds that you won't even understand what it is. Mm -hmm. So, so taking the time, you know, as editors and publishing houses do, as casting directors, how many bad actors do casting directors see in routine auditions on a yearly basis? But if you don't live in hope that the next person who walks in the door is going to be, you know, Audrey McDonald, then you should get out of the business. You know, just reading and reading and reading and reading will 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 help you understand what's going on. So where we are now is everyone has an agent. Everyone has agents and managers. You know, the same, the same five people win all the prizes. Yeah. You know, it, it, it has gotten to the point where there's so many gatekeepers <coughs> that, um, that it, it's, it's very hard to function. I mean, it's almost like you want to get rid of that and just start the unsolicited. I have pictures of my cats lying on piles of manuscripts. You know? <laughs> but, but at least people, people feel like they can have access to things. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it, it all has to do with money. I mean, I found out a couple of years ago that agents get a statement right before Christmas every year which tells them how much money they've brought into the agency that year. Mm -hmm. And they're obviously not going to have a big, big number that they're sh you know, shepherding all their clients into theater productions. They're going to have a bigger number if they're shepherding all their clients into writing for TV shows. So, so there's so many forces at work that that, that are cutting people off. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, when I ask this question for the book, what is, what is, the, what is the best thing that a, a director said, I mean, a drama director said to you, Bruce Norris, I think it was Michelle Tattenbaugh was a friend of his, I can't remember who, who told him this, um, said, always put three things in your play that after the reading, you can say to the dramaturgs, "You see, I took your advice, yeah. and that will help get your play <laughs> into the theater." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you all know yeah. Bruce Norris. That's so cynical, but that's sort of true on some level. And it's horrifying that that that, that the dramaturgs feel like they that that they have to have this gatekeeping position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know quite what to be what to be to do about it. I mean, you know, like when I think about it. It's Really interesting to hear the kind of historical context on, on that because. Oh, and there's one last thing I just forgot to and, and when the NEA, start, I mean, when the uh, Ford Foundation started, do you know what the percentage of people in America who had been in a theater was? This is like 1966. 5% of Americans had been in a theater. Because we're not a, we're an, a nation of immigrants. So 
it was not like, you know, starting theaters in Germany. <coughs> and people had no idea what theaters, very few people in America. And look at no, the number of people who go to theater now. It's absolutely incredible. So it's had an effect. I'm sorry to you. No worries. I, I, I think it's a, I have, I'm not good at uh, in math, but uh, the population has exploded. Um, and so the, the fact that there are um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of directors and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dramaturgs now, and thousands upon thousands of actors can continue on the ex exponential. I think that at the beginning, for Canada anyway, in the, in the 60s, uh, the amount of people who are working professionally right now would have made up a lot of who the core audience were in terms of who actually was in love amateur or wanted to be engaged in this thing. And I feel that the gatekeeping, a friend of mine went back to law school like about 10 years ago and he said, oh yeah, we just go to the website now and we read summaries of all the court cases. That's how we get through all of the reading required to get our law degrees. And 20 years before then, you couldn't have gotten through law school unless you read the whole thing, right? So we're having, there's so much data because there's so many of us now and we're all trying to control how many, how many of us there are and how much data that represents that I agree, like we are in this place of, it's broken <coughs> in terms of relying on systems to do it. Your idea of just randomness or conversation or saying I love it, <laughs> you know, I just love it. You know, why do you love it? I don't know, I just love it. Um, and yet we don't have a place in the financial picture to kind of hold that. Like I just, uh, I've just been working on a piece and the, the requirement that we knew what the piece was from a budgetary and marketing perspective before it was created, even though everyone understood that we were creating it as we were going, like literally doing that. And within the room there was discord amongst the company because they felt that it was a, it was made sense that we should know what it was before we knew what it was. <laughs> and I think we're caught in this kind of looping and so the gatekeeping I think actually speaks to that because we're all in trying to find ways to open things more and by doing that I think we're also <laughs> helping to shut things down a bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in this back and forth. Well, yeah, I mean, you're right. But on the other hand, I mean, I, I mean I've been meeting this director's lab for the summer and, and it's quite an interesting group. I mean, I have a stateless person from Kuwait coming in. I have people coming in from, from you know, countries in Africa who, who, who have absolutely no way of even paying the visa fees. So, you know, everybody has problems, okay? And, and, and what you're describing is exactly the way that theaters operate. Um, and, and at some point, you know, you, you, you have to just suck it up and have everybody dislike you and say, this is just not the way it's going to work. It's yeah. just not happening this way. Mm -hmm. This is what you think because you are working in marketing or you're working, you were trained and, you know, you have a degree from some college in theater management, but you are not allowing this work to happen. And unless you just make yourself really disliked, then it's not going to happen. I mean, you just have to develop a skin where, where you just, because because it is a problem, but it's not the same problem as an N17 Kuwaiti passport, you know? Mm -hmm. Someone making theater with that. I mean, it's all kind of relative. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it, and I'm not discounting the problem. But again, this Todd London book, when you look at what people had to go through to start these theaters in certain times with no resources, no buildings, but, but ideas, art, and a community that they contacted, it, 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 it puts it in perspective. I mean, I, I also have come to, to be a, a big believer in, I know this is going to sound weird, and it's not even a question of audience size, but I've become a big believer in popular shows. Hmm. And, and, and maybe they're popular with a smaller audience or a theater, a popular with a big audience, but, but plays that play to the converted, um, while they might be fun, I mean, it, 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 the current example that we're all quoting is Hamilton, you know, I mean, hmm. look at what that play has done, that musical has done, it's absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. and, and 
you know, if you look at the group theater, if you look at Steppenwolf, if you look at the Moscow art, you look at Shakespeare, and the population of London, you know, 1600 is something like 350,000. The Globe seats 2,000 people. A lot of people saw those shows. And they saw them for different reasons. Some of them just wanted to be entertained. Some of them saw them with political analogies. Some were, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, but, but, but something about connecting with a community of a city or a community of a zeitgeist or time so that it doesn't just become theater people talking to theater people. So I think what you were saying is absolutely true, that everybody who, who studied theater is now the audience for theater, but it's, it's, it's your law school roommates who are reading those summaries that you want to sort of bring in somehow either on board as board members or as, as audiences or somehow. That seems to be, uh, to me, the next interesting task. <coughs> I want to open it up for questions. Anyone have a question? Who's going to start? Yeah. Um, I have a, a question that I think brings together two threads. Um, uh, because you mentioned narrative at the beginning and your interest in disrupting narrative. And I've been thinking a lot about that and how conventional narrative is generally focused on one individual um, and how hard it is to tell stories that break that up when you want to appeal to a popular audience. And the reason, I, the reason I'm thinking about that is because I think that dictators manipulate narrative in that way by focusing, focusing on only one story. So, uh, so I guess I'm thinking about this, wow, this is not very organized, but <laughs> I'm thinking about this in, in connection to sort of the broader social narrative and how, and how theater simultaneously disrupts it, but also supports it. And I guess I'm just wondering if you're thinking about that. Well, I think you're making a lot of assumptions that I wouldn't agree with. I mean, okay. I mean one of the most, po oddly, one of the most popular writers of the last hundred years, and I mean sheer, just popular in terms of regular people who like to see their work, is Beckett. If, if you're ever worried about your theater not attracting an audience, do a Beckett play. I mean, <laughs> people love Beckett. I don't know why, but they, they <laughs> I know why I love Beckett, but you, you would not expect that crowds would come to see, you know, I'll go on, whatever. Um, so, so I, so I and, and, and similarly, you know, the, 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 the dis dissolution of former <coughs> Yugoslavia started a theater conference. So, so theater has, has many roles, and the assumption that you're making is that traditional narrative attracts and, and supports a traditional um, uh, 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 governmental, or let's say, structure. I don't know that that's true or not. Mm -hmm. And I think theater, uh, theater of many kinds, you know, traditional structures, non-traditional structures, can can do different things. I, I have not noticed that correlation. Sarah, do you want to talk about the show you have on at Luminato in terms of narrative? <laughs> <laughs> or not? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a verbatim piece uh, about um, a woman who looked out her window and saw a man beaten to death by the police here in Toronto. Uh, and it's, um, and its first half is, uh, is told through sort of a, a parallel structure of storytelling. Uh, there's a live artist who works throughout the, the story uh, through the first half uh, to, to render a subject into, into being. Uh, and then there's a more uh, conventional, from a Eurocentric sort of storytelling position, uh, uh, a narrative that starts at the beginning and, and moves through to the end. Um, the second half of the show is, uh, is a deconstruction of that. Um, and. Uh, and I, and I think um, and I think the intention, the the attempt that was that we are investigating with this piece is 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 it possible 
to tell stories from a multiplicity of perspectives um, in, a, in a shared time space as opposed to consecutively. Um, and, you know, I think there's moments that are successful and there's moments that, that it's very different responses from very different people on how the piece uh, is, in, is being told, um, but uh, the audience is an important storytelling agent in that piece and the audience is different each night and so too is a particular uh, speaker each night. So, um, you know, and to, to your, to your his, his sort of historic point, say the group or whatever, there's, I'm, I'm working in many traditions that have been around for forever, um, uh, in traditions that I know about for forever, and I think in many other <coughs> cultures, probably similarly, there have been these different ways of gathering and storytelling um, for <coughs> forever. But, um, but I am interested in that question of the uh, sort of the tyranny of, of a one perspective uh, narrative, and I do think that it, it is a dislocator for certainly many, many people in this country, and in particular um, from the perspective of, you know, through the indigenous, um, which has many, many, um, 600 plus um, governing uh, nations within that, but many different solo perspectives. One of my uh, uh, People who inspire me greatly, Jan Derbyshire, always talks about how one means one, one size fits one, I should say, mm -hmm. not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has a real, that's a really challenging perspective for the theater. Mm -hmm. And it's one, though, that I'm really interested in bringing to the theater, is what does that mean? Like, what does it mean to, uh, at this moment when we are so segregated in our uh, digital worlds, where we are becoming more part of a sort of a data kind of minefield, um, without our consent, um, what does it mean to uh, to ask audiences to come to the show? Uh, Out the window is popular, uh, but it's not a big. It's not a. It's not a huge house, but it is popular. Um, however, were it not, I still think that it's the kind of work that could lead to it being more popular somewhere down the road because it's engaging in conversations that aren't necessarily happening. Um, so, I don't know. Like I. Uh, yeah, so many feelings right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the back there. Yeah. Um, I just have a question. Uh, you both made reference to this word popular and brought a lot of different work under the heading of popular. Uh, both, uh, I think, I know for myself, uh, I tend to conflate popular with what we would call like big P, pop. Hmm. Um, and I'd love to hear you both of your perspectives on what makes uh, a, pop, a, a popular theater, perhaps small P, because you're bringing in Hamilton and Beckett and of window kind of in this field of pop. And so I think it'd be really interesting uh, to really both kind of break down your definitions of popular theater. Well, I, I don't think it, you know, I don't really think it, it ultimately has much to do with audience size. I, I think it has more to do with, with um, reaching into the community, what, whatever that community is. In other words, if, if theater, is only being made and played to theater people, I think it's a problem. Uh, and I always say to the directors in the lab on the first day, after that I'm again gone, is, is if you all think about your aunts, or, or your uncles for that matter, you know, what would they feel? What, what are they interested in seeing? Um, and there's usually a groan at that point, but I mean, <laughs> you want to be able to to have theater function in society in some way um, that that isn't so self-referential. You know, now I have a, I, you know, I mean, theater was never a, a profession that had academic training. <coughs> I mean, everyone was trained up until the really in the 60s, as apprentices. They carried spears, they you know, started in the costume shop, and then they kind of worked their way up. So now everybody's gone to college, they have student debt, and, and they have to you know, make theater for other people. Who, and, and that sort of puts theater in, in a very, in a box. So I'm saying if, if the theater is, is good and can, and can address issues and, and create a forum that's exciting, and, and speak to, to people, whoever they are, who aren't exactly the people that you've studied with, that, that's what I mean by popular. And it could be a, a, a large number, and it could just be, I mean, again, these theaters that are in small communities that are really speaking to whatever the issues are, it's almost like town hall meetings or something, that's very valuable. So I think, again, this Todd London book is very interesting because a lot of these theaters were not, you know, they're not performing in the, 
in the uh, you know in the Helen Hayes Theater or something. I mean, they're they're performing in small in smaller venues, but were very uh, very important to the communities, and, and some still are. Did you want to respond? No, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ariane Van Buren, a John Turk in New York. Um, I would be curious. I'd like to know your perspective on to what extent to be popular the story in the United States, and it's probably different in Canada. Uh, does the story need to be self-referential to that community and that country, or how, or, or whether it can be open to different forms and different politics and different humor from abroad? I mean, I, I, I've just been reading all this stuff about Fitzgerald, you know, who, who had a very uh, charmed but difficult, damned life in some degree, you know. And I, I think unlike maybe television or, <coughs> you know, I think it's so difficult to write a play. It's difficult to write a novel, especially one that is, um, you know, artistically great, that it's almost like you're barely in control of it. It's in control of you. And when you know, you all know writers and you know, you speak to them, I mean, it, it's trying to come through you in some way that you're trying to perceive and you're trying to master and you're trying to focus and edit and, and figure out and then later with an editor or a dramaturg, maybe you'll, you'll finish it that it isn't a question of like going to a restaurant and ordering up, I'm gonna do a play that does this. Or it's, it's sort of like, that's what you have to do, you know? I mean, we're living in a different time now. It's the same in art, you know? I mean, if you're an artist, that, you know, Van Gogh saw, that's how he saw it. He, he painted what he saw. Nobody liked it, nobody could understand it, and then thank God his brother saved the paintings and then took him a while, and then other people said, oh, that's interesting. But I don't know that, Unlike, you know, we see in TV where somebody says, let's do a series about, uh, let's find some writers. So, so I, I, I think it's sort of out of people's control. And, and, and the job of a dramaturg and a director is, is, to, is to go to shows, to read shows, to read plays, and, and to find a certain sympathy with voices and say, I, I love this. I, I mean, I just read Maxwell Perkins, can you imagine this? His letter when he got the manuscript of Gatsby. And he was so generous to Fitzgerald. He just said, this is the most, what was the word he used? The most spiritual book I've ever read. I mean, it, it was like, a, it, was the, it was a letter that any writer would dream of getting. And, and Fitzgerald just like exhausted crossing the marathon finish line, collapsing, you know? I mean, that's, that's your job is to find that. And I, I always suggest to the directors in the director's lab, you know, if you see something, and I'm not talking about doing this to, you know, Kevin Klein or, you know, to Susan Laurie Parks or somebody, people who are already very famous, but if you see a play or you see an actor or you see a designer working at a small theater whose work just really turns you on, write them a note and leave it at the stage door. And no, no director or designer or young playwright at you know a small theater is not going to open that envelope and just say, "I'm just a young director, but I really respond to your work." And if you ever, you know, want to have a cup of coffee, and that's how you begin to build these relationships. So I, I think I think art is something that's bigger than us. That's out of the control of the people. So you have to kind of find the people who whose work you like, and then help them in some way, you know, support them. Maybe financially, if you can find the money, or... <coughs> yeah. yeah, so um, as an artist of color, I do think that gatekeeping is very real, and that's just a part of the reality of the situation. Um, and likewise, I think we're living in a world where the goalposts keep changing, where it's like, you know what, you need a little bit more experience. So you get the MFA, and it's like, you know what, we want you to have more real-world experience, so you're a little too, too advanced. Um, and so my question to you is, um, how do we dismantle gatekeeping when it's the funding structures that perpetuate it? You know, put your shoulder to the wheel. That's all I can tell you. I mean, I mean, I am so old. There are a few people in this room who are as old as I am. 
the, 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 the things that I encountered when I was starting out are, when I talk about them, and I'm not going to, they sound like I'm from the Middle Ages. You know? I mean, it's like this stateless person who's trying to get here. You know, there, there are obstacles. There are obstacles, constant obstacles. They, 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 are, they, have been, they are personal in nature. They are the plague closing the theaters in England for two a year, and everyone couldn't work because you couldn't gather in theaters. Um, and, and, and the obstacles now are just as bad as the obstacles were then. And you, you just have to create. You have to persevere. You have to have good ideas. You have to make friends. You have to support. You have to, you know, write things, believe in things, find people who are writing things depending on your position, make things happen, talk people into doing things for free, you know. That's how you begin. It, 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 is, it is not changed ever. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a reprehensible state, but I, if I could tell you that there was a simple solution where all would be possible, I would be delighted to do so. I think, I think better things are happening now than in the medieval period when I started, but, but uh, <coughs> I don't know if that's going to end. No. No, you're in it. I mean, I think a lot about policy, uh, which is, you know, anathema to uh, creativity. Um, however, I, I went to uh, Australia about five or six years ago. And when I went, one of my friends said that, um, uh, uh, actually, you know this person, Yvette Nolan. She was here yesterday. Anyway, Yvette said uh, it, there's like four, in terms of, Countries uh, at that point in her in her thinking, uh, Australia was the furthest uh, was was the third. So it went um, New Zealand, Canada, uh, Australia, and then the United States in terms of there being a an, a, a, an acknowledgement and appreciation of the sort of the the colonial sort of genocidal impulses in all manners in all four of those countries. And uh, Jill Kiley, the artistic director of English Theatre, and I went to Australia, and every single theater that we visited had a policy statement in each of their brochures and on their websites at that time that um, recognized and honored the First Peoples of Australia at that point. And it was brand new at that time. And I can tell you that in the five years since, it's been an enormous shift, like huge shift in terms of the amount of work, the amount of funding for that work, the amount of international um, work, uh, sort of cross-border work that's happening, um, and sort of a, a cross-indigenous kind of uh, collaborative model, the amount of festivals working into uh, South America, it's like there's, it's, it's really extraordinary. So I think there, there are certain ways in which um, getting those statements out, and uh, Sarah Ahmed talks a lot about how you can get the statements out and then kind of walk away from them, you know, and they're, they're, it's said that, you know, uh, we're completely a non-racist organization there. It says it in our, in our uh, wording so everyone can go and, and do whatever they do usually. But, but she would also say, and I would agree, that getting the statements there and then, and then having op opportunities to reread and revisit um, is really, really important. And I think it is different in Canada in terms of how we, um, uh, and maybe it's because we're smaller and less powerful and uh, <coughs> Possibly, but I think that we're a little bit more uh, open to policy and to sort of social uh, social policy as as ideas for um, improving particular uh, issues, social issues. Yeah, I don't know if that's. I just want to say I was reading the local paper, the Daily Mail, yesterday, and there was an editorial complaining about ha having opened the floodgates for indigenous respect and everything. And I didn't know this was all happening, being an American, and I was delighted to discover it, but then to immediately see that there's uh, an opposing camp. Oh, yes. Yeah, no surprise. Sure. But it makes me think to everyone here, including the young dramaturgs, that every, every achievement to move things forward, <coughs> it's frustrating, but it has to be fought for because it's, there's opposing forces that are trying to take it away all the time. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous, but that's another part of the, the tough reality that these obstacles we have to deal with societally, and they intersect with everything we do, including theater. 
Yeah, Ilana. Hi, uh, Ilana Bernstein um, in Boston. And I, I heard you say, so I heard Phaedra ask specifically, it seemed to me, they asked me about gatekeeping that keeps out people of color, artists of color, systems that are really set up in oppressive, supremacist ways. And I, I felt like I heard you say, work harder. And I just love to know if that's indeed what the answer was, or if there's more you want to say about that. Well, I mean, I think, I think, you know, I agree with you. I think things are really changing, and that's because people are doing things. Um, I mean, the change comes from the people who are doing things. And, and when, when plays come along, or productions come along, or ideas for organizations come along, I, I, I think they, that they will find reception. Uh, the people who say no are not the creative people. They're not the people who are going to think of the solutions to the things. So, so the, it's, it's the, it is, the, the change is going to come from the people who create. And, and I believe that it's always come from the people who create. And it, it always seems slow, um, uh, but I think it, it's, you know, look at the American Revolution. I mean, it took a while for, for that to get done. I, 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 I believe in the force of creativity, and I think that if you, if you create with a group of writers or collective or whatever, and it's good, you'll find your way. Um, and I think you have to have that, uh, I think you have to have that uh, <coughs> attitude. And I think, I don't know, I mean, I think there, there are many examples where, well, forever, but recently as well, where people really respond to that. It's not, it, you know, it, it may not be the gatekeepers, it may be other people who respond to it, and then the gatekeepers go, oh, there is a market for this, or oh, there is a, you know. Not everyone has the same degree of imagination. Yeah. Sarah, you were talking about um, at the beginning uh, the whole thing of race and class and story, and you were saying that at one point, if I understood that as you have worked and you know deadlines change, you have to push openings because how the creation is evolving, has, if we're truly going to listen, is is changing. And uh, and you know you make the comment that we would we make ourselves all out of you know ideally we make ourselves out of a job or out of work and I'm very interested in that and I'm wondering how uh, if you could articulate more on that in terms of of uh, of that concept and how, and where the work that you've been doing or or that this this discovery is. can you speak more to that. Sure. I mean, first of all, the the we is a really difficult word to use because uh, who will be put out of work? The we that includes um, I'm in my fifties. I'm white. I'm queer, um, uh, and uh, that's probably maybe not the queer part, but that's probably who I'm speaking about in terms of um, that that there are millions and millions of people who have stories that are not being valued, not being heard, and would easily pay good money to see those stories um, told. And uh, and so the, the, the question of gatekeeping, going back to, sorry, my mind's all over the place, but going back to that, because it, it connects, it's, uh, it's it's quite simply that we're, we're, the population in the world has, has significantly changed, it was already not the way we were told it was. Like the story of colonization is a really great story, it's just one story, but I grew up believing it was the story. Like it was the Bible and colonization, it was like that was the world. You know, so with respect to the ways in which we create story, um, uh, the, the timelines are part of that original um, idea and, uh, and that's tied to capitalism, and that's tied to the ordering of the, the chaos of the world. It's a really great, it was very, very brilliant as a way to do one thing. It's also deeply damaging and negates the, the stories and voices of so many other people. So that, I think, impacts every way in which this country, I hope, in Canada, will start to tell different stories. And so the, the work that I've 
been doing, in particular the National Arts Centre, and the, the opening of, of, of an Indigenous theatre department there, for me is so critical because I think that though, that's the centre of our story. That's where we need to start. In this, on this land, in this space, we need to look to those, to those traditions, to the, the peoples who were here first, and let a new kind of story and a new way of processing collaboration to emerge from, uh, from this ground, from this land, not from an import of an idea which has uh, th those trains running on time. You know, mm -hmm. thank God the trains ran on time. Like, I love trains running on time because I grew up in that tradition. Mm -hmm. I'm, that, I'm attuned to that. Mm -hmm. I will fall back to that. Um, and so, uh, uh, all, all I can say is be as uncomfortable, if you're a white person, be as uncomfortable as you can be at any turn. Put yourself in situations where you're not um, sitting on the stage and speaking about uh, uh, what you know. T try to find ways to turn that around so that, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Amy, yeah. Hi there, Amy Brooks, Roadside Theatre, and I want to thank you for all the talk you've done about community and arts, and I really appreciate that, Anne. And shouting out an ideal theatre, and so proud of your Roadside Theatre as well. I feel it. And, but I do want to lift up uh, what Phaedra and Alana have been saying about arts world inequality, because I know for the early career dramaturgs, it's something that uh, the artists are going out into this world are facing an economy where arts world inequality, objectively, we know from Jeff Chang and Andy Horwitz, The Atlantic, and the Helicon Collaborative, it's worse than U.S. income inequality right now. And I just want to throw out a couple of figures. Of every foundation dollar, 11 cents goes to the arts. 5.5 cents of that goes to arts organizations with budgets of more than 5 million, who make up just 2% of all the arts organizations. But only one cent of every foundation dollar goes to arts organizations <coughs> in underrepresented communities. Less than half a cent goes to arts organizations doing what they call social justice work. Mm. So it's not, I, I just want to kind of uplift this idea that I really don't believe that it's just a, oh well, the inimitable forces of history and artists will always have to push back. There's a real machine in place now to disempower artists from uh, marginalized communities. And that's a inner city problem, that's a rural working class problem. <laughs> So my question for you, Anne, is um, as allies who are on different ends of the economic spectrum, how can we connect our communities to realize this beloved community that we're, I believe we are all working for, we are? I mean, it seems like a no-brainer to me. you got to do it. I mean, uh, do you, when you say you, do you mean me? Like, no, I mean, you? I mean, you know, this room. I mean, the artists have got to do it. The government is not going to do it. I mean, look at look at the United States right now. I mean, are, are we expecting members of Congress to suddenly become enlightened and do this? I mean, and, and I don't know that that's really, there have been, there have been advocates in, in past decades that have, that have understood this. But it's not coming from that end. It's coming from people <coughs> creating things that people want to see that become a phenomenon, and maybe it's a phenomenon of 80 people a night, or 70 people a night, or neighbors are broad, or whatever. But um, but it, it, it comes from it comes from the ground. It's always come from the ground. It, it isn't asking people who you can't access and have no interest or understanding or appreciation of it to change. They're, they they don't get it. They're never going to get it. They never have gotten it. It's it's created by artists. No one, no one, you know, has ever appointed any artist, any playwright you love to anything. Nobody, nobody gave August Wilson a million dollars and said create, you know, a cycle of plays. He just started writing. Uh, I mean, so that's what I'm saying. Is it's, it's, you have agency. It's, uh, it's up to you. And it's, it's your collaborators, your mission, your belief. You're talking somebody into giving you a space. You leaflet things, people to get people to come. I mean, that's that's how it's always been, and it's usually because you don't like the theater that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. That's what prompted Chekhov. You know, they hated Salvini, so they started, you know, the Moscow Art Theater. And I, I think that 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 sense has not changed through through the history of theater. It's up to the artists who don't like what's going on to change it, mm -hmm. and they are. 
I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap things up now, but thank you both so much. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Sarah.